International Media TV, television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, exploring this topic uh, by returning our attentions <clears throat> to uh, the origins of uh, the so-called New World, and in particular, uh, the period in the development of our history when literacy was punishable by death. Uh, the fact that being literate uh, for the native or the slave uh, was met with capital punishment, I think, is critical to the understanding of multiracial American literature. I think part of what characterizes uh, the uniqueness of that tradition is the fact that there is this relationship with literacy uh, so, with that in mind, I, I begin by uh, directing that uh, to you, uh, John Keane. Counter Narratives uh, deals with this very explicitly uh, in terms of um, the development of the New World uh, throughout the Americas. Uh, would you agree uh, with the point that the centuries in which uh, our literacy was punishable by death is, is part of what characterizes a multiracial tradition in literature in America? That's a, that's a fascinating and, and a, I think immense question. And so one way, I w one way that I would approach it and that I try to approach it in, uh, in counter narratives was to sort of think about the relationship that you know, people like Walter Ong have talked about between orality and literacy. Can you guys hear me? Yes, okay. I'll try to talk louder. Uh, okay, um, the relationship between orality uh, and uh, literacy, and the ways in which um, uh, enslaved uh, and uh, free people of color uh, developed various kinds of ways, various kinds of modes of communication, ways of um, passing on knowledge uh, uh, that that was not. Um, solely the province of uh, the literate, right? Um, what I'm also sort of, what I was also sort of interested in was to think about the, the, the various kinds of uh, and modes of exchange of knowledge, right? Not using the literate, but mm -hmm. also the ways in which people began to enter the sphere of literacy mm -hmm. and uh, transform it uh, even early on. I mean, one of the things that I always tell my students is, and that sort of fascinates me to no end, is that the second published woman poet uh, in, uh, the, in the United States, what's now the United States, was an African-American woman. Mm -hmm. So even very, very early on when we think about the African-American tradition, I'm talking about Phyllis Wheatley, um, and even before her, uh, Lucy Terry's poem, Lucy Terry wrote her poem, Bar's Fight. But uh, very early on when we think about American literature, um, it is already being transformed by uh, these other voices, and I, I won't rehearse the whole story of, uh, of Wheatley's uh, coming into her voice and her publication, but um, even with that, we, we see there's a, a, tremendous amount of, uh, a tremendous amount of struggle, but at the same time, triumph when she uh, issues her work, and uh, you know, it, it sort of opens up a space for mm -hmm. others to enter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> with, with that in mind, uh, I'm, I'm interested in exploring this uh, in terms of how the development of literature here uh, in the Americas um, in respect to race uh, has been, uh, to, to a large extent, a market-driven. In other words, uh, racial identities ostensibly emerge from a, a market-driven society. Uh, uh, that is to say that the language, um, in as much as it can express gaining and maintaining power, uh, is something that 
from a multiracial tradition, uh, we gain a, a, a much greater insight into what those power relationships can be, uh, what those modalities of identity are. Uh, Emily, you've written about this quite a bit in uh, Searching for Zion. Do you think it's, it's fair to say that, that much of what is assumed as racial identities is, in fact, coming from a market-driven point of view? I'm not sure what I have to say about the market yet because I'm still processing the question you put to John. Okay. But I th I'm thinking about it at, even as a mother. Yeah. Um, Victor and I are, are married to each other and we have two children, one of whom is about to turn five. And so in a way he's, he's entering, he's, he's starting to recognize sight words and learn to read. So he's entering um, the point of, of literacy in so far as he, w he will soon start to become an independent reader. Mm -hmm. But he also um, has been literate already for a while. I mean, his literacy is also involved in the fact that we read to him and we delight as, as writers and people who love literature and reading mm -hmm. to him. But um, your question reminded me that we have a poster of uh, Frederick Douglass in our household. Mm -hmm. It's not on the wall. It's actually folded, uh, rolled up and it's in our umbrella stand. It's in our umbrella stand. But he often pulls it out to use it like a telescope. Huh. Uh -huh. And sometimes he unfolds it and he asks and he asks about who the man is in the picture. And he looks a little bit like his grandfather, my my father, with the white huh. hair. And I so he's asking that question: Who is this man? Yeah. Uh, we had to answer that question. He's Frederick Douglass, and he's on a poster because. Um, He's a very important man. Well, why is he important? This is, so these are questions from like a four-year-old who just turned five. Huh. So, so how, do we talk, how do we begin to talk about slavery with, with a child? And how do we begin to talk about yeah. racial identity? For me, the, the choice about how to talk about that with our child um, involved uh, thinking about literacy, um, something that he can understand as being unfair at that age. Mm -hmm. Uh, because he loves books so much um, mm -hmm. and wants so desperately to learn to read and to write. Uh, the story that we felt like he could understand at this age as well, this man lived in a time where there were people who told him um, he couldn't, he wasn't allowed, he wasn't allowed to read. Mm -hmm. um, they took that power, they wouldn't allow him that power. Mm -hmm. And he's important because he fought, he ran away from those people um, he understood that that was unfair and he fought for the right. He learned to read mm -hmm. and he wrote and he read and he fought so that other people could also be literate. And that's the beginning of his understanding of slavery. Like mm -hmm. that narrative for him is about um, the power in involved in uh, being literate and yeah. that there was a time when things were so unfair that certain people and this was one of them, you know, we're not, we're not allowed to be that and had to fight for that. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. That's the beginning of his understanding for, for entering five huh. um, about what slavery is. It, right. It's just interesting for me as a mother that, that that's a very hard conversation to begin to think about having with your child. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew he would get, he would get it, that that mm -hmm. was really unfair, that mm -hmm. there was a time when some people were told they wouldn't be allowed to have that mm -hmm. pleasure and that power in their lives. Mm -hmm. And Victor, what's, what's your, your take on this? That's for, oh, okay, that'll work. Yeah, we can swing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think uh, along the lines of uh, what both John and Emily have said, that uh, um, just the idea that, th that this, the importance of literacy, I, I, I guess I'm, thinking, I'm still thinking of what Emily just related about our son. Uh, and um, the way to spark that conversation for him, uh, right? Like a, I think a, a way I might have thought to talk about, talk to him about something like slavery, and uh, when before he was born, would have been to say like, well, there was a time when this group of people had power over this group of people, and these were the, and it would, and I just would have, we would have seen the glaze, mm -hmm. and just see him get disinterested mm -hmm. immediately. Like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, let's play. You know, mm -hmm. um, but because it's a thing that he cares about, 
mm -hmm. and he understands that someone was not allowed to do a thing he cares about, it becomes a thing he can, he can then understand and imbue with importance, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and thinking about that just as, as a way of even t how one, if we're talking about like multiracial literature, right? right? Like how people talk across, if we call them races, ethnic groups, whatever they might be, that part of the uh, way that we make people understand different realities mm -hmm. through literature is often by saying, here's a thing that one character of a, of a type values. You may also value something similar. Mm -hmm. And here is how or why the lack of that or gaining that was important. Mm -hmm. you know? And so uh, what I guess I mean to say is that um, for most of us, we're at the level of a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as far as our understanding of, and that, that's a beautiful thing. That, that if you can make a five-year-old understand a thing, you can make a 50-year-old understand a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that when, even when we, this panel was coming up about multiracial literature, I was thinking about that idea of, that maybe part of it is about this idea of communicating across uh, gulfs that people act as if, act as if they are un, uncrossable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that in fact the whole point of the, 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 the the whole point of the job of literature, right, is to expand the circle of compassion that one feels mm -hmm. for another type of human being, right? The history of, uh, say, the novel at least, right, is that it begins with uh, stories about people from the mercantile class, right? If you go back to, uh, say, the European novel at least, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the mercantile class, people who were within that mercantile class being interesting, complex, good people, and all their servants in those very early novels are terrible worthless, untrustworthy beings. Mm -hmm. And everything that they do is out to destroy that mercantile class. And that was because the people in that mercantile class were just working hard at being compassionate about themselves. Mm -hmm. And then you see later waves of novels where suddenly those servants are the characters who, are, who, who, who matter in the stories. Mm -hmm. And then they got to figure out a different group of people somewhere else, like the, uh, um, the natives of the land they're in. They're the terrible people, mm -hmm. right? And, as more novels are written by more different kinds of people, the circle of compassion that is literature grows and grows and grows. Mm -hmm. And the idea of writing more and more novels from more and more perspectives is that in theory, eventually the entire globe is inside that mm. circle of compassion, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But that that is to some degree the project, at least I imagine as the project of literature. Now, now uh, is, is this a conscious strategy on your own part in terms of your novels? I'm thinking of The, the Devil in Silver, where the ensemble is multiracial, multiethnic. Uh, it represents a, a broad uh, and very diverse group, the people who are in the uh, ward and where Pepper is locked up. Mm -hmm. uh, is this part of your own uh, strategy in terms of how you organize the novel? I would, I would just say that the, uh, so um, my last novel uh, w took place in a mental unit in uh, southeast Queens, and the, the group of people inside, the novel is about the multiracial cast of patients, but also the multiracial cast, uh, multiracial staff, and the ways that all of them are, both patients and staffs are victims of this really corrupt medical system, mm -hmm. uh, and how it's killing all of them, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but uh, I know those, I knew those kinds of people um, because of my own family's history with mental illness and being in and out of hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way, that was the, that's probably the extent of my circle of compassion. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in the beginning of the novel, there are some uh, NYPD members who throw Pepper into the unit for completely callous and uh, uh, sort of out of laziness and callousness. Mm -hmm. And so my circle of compassion did not expand, right? There's no moment where you come back later and be like, oh, well, here was why they were, so, right? So I had limits to my circle of compassion as well. So I need like a kid who grew up with loving members of the NYPD to write their book and then I'll understand the cops mm -hmm. in a way that I cannot understand the cops, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that in that way, everybody can build and build and build. So not necessarily conscious, but it's just, it's what I had available in mm -hmm. my sort of data bank of compassion. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in returning uh, to the question that I introduced at the beginning of our discussion in characterizing the multiracial tradition as having emerged from a period when literacy was punishable by death, I suggested that part of what characterizes this tradition is an understanding of language that is unique to a people that emerge 
from that historical situation, uh, that there is an understanding in that tradition of uh, the unexpressed but intended and the unintentionally expressed uh, that really uh, doesn't occur uh, to those who did not emerge from a period of uh, slavery. Um, do, you, do you think that that is uh, fair to say, and is that still a vital part of uh, the tradition today? John? Okay. Well, that's a, another great question, and I'm actually going to, uh, if I can, go back to the question that you asked Emily, because it got me <laughs> thinking. I, I, I'm, I'll, I'll speak to this, but I, I'm going to say the title altogether. It's got me thinking that, you know, the history of the production of what we think of as race is deeply tied to um, the development of capitalism. That's right. And slavery, when we talk about uh, capitalism in the Americas, mm -hmm. you know, slavery is um, uh, a constitutive part of that. Mm -hmm. So often when we talk about slavery, it, it seems like, and not to say we, okay. So when slavery is sort of discussed or depicted or presented, uh, you know, by Hollywood or on TV, uh, there we get a sense that, you know, this is a money-making enterprise, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about people, human beings who are treated as property and they have a monetary value and, you know, there are extraordinary stories of, like the one that uh, Imner B.C. Philip writes about in Zong, you know, where uh, people would rather let, you know, the, the people running the ship would rather let uh, the enslaved people uh, drown, you know, and get the insurance money than then save them, et cetera. So, so I mean, I think this is always kind of uh, you know in the in the backdrop even of our contemporary history. Um, but 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 what we also I think we also want to think about is that you know slavery also parallels the Enlightenment, and it's mm -hmm. in the Enlightenment that we get these uh, discourses about the human uh, mm -hmm. and about the non-human, about the citizen. Uh, you know, who who is, who who can be part of. Uh, a given society, a given nation, right? Um, and, uh, and and part of that, of course, has to do with race. You know, um, most of the great uh, you know European philosophers also had, and we don't usually see this, had you know uh, sort of elaborate pronouncements about uh, taking is one example, you know, uh, Immanuel Kant, about race and, uh, you know, uh, people who were black, et cetera. So I say all this to say that um, when, when you, I, I, your, your comment about the market to me is really fascinating because, right. right, it does, I mean, I think there is a way of thinking about the market, capitalism, slavery, uh, and race that we, we don't do so, so often. Um, and when I say we, again, I'm thinking of sort of <laughs> our larger public discourse. But as Victor was saying, you know, I mean, we're, it's almost like we are still, you know, five-year-olds uh, as, a, as a society in, a, in terms of our public, public discourse about thinking about these issues. Because, of course, if we think about the past with complexity, it requires that we think about the present with complexity. That's and it really right. does kind of implicate, you know, mm -hmm. our society. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a reason our society looks the way it does and it mm -hmm. operates the way it does, right? And, uh, you know, at the core of that is the market is capitalism. And now, uh, you know, it's, of course, neoliberal capitalism where everyone is supposed to be a market and this is supposed to be a positive good, <laughs> but it, it, I, don't, I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> to, to, uh, to further that point, uh, Leslie DeMong in his uh, book, uh, Faces of the Gods, discusses how in the early history of Haiti, at one point there were 80 major racial classifications in the court, all of which uh, determined how much property one could own, mm -hmm. uh, how much one could inherit, you know, who could marry who, and so forth and so on. Emily, in, in Searching for Zion, you explore uh, black identity throughout uh, the diaspora. At the beginning, as John was picking up on a moment ago, uh, I talked about uh, racial identities being market driven. Uh, in your work in searching for Zion, did you find that uh, to be true in the explorations and travels that you made, that there was a, uh, a condition of black identity that was, that was market driven in each environment? Uh, so I was, I was interested in Searching for Zion, the book Justin's talking about, uh, my last book, in um, exploring black utopias. So I, I, I visited communities of um, 
people who identify as black who had, le who had left uh, home, in many cases that was the United States, in order to find home elsewhere out of feelings of dispossession or disenchantment, uh, disenfranchisement. Um, and uh, so the communities that I visited included uh, a, a large group of black Americans who, who'd been living in Israel um, since the 1960s. They also included a group of um, Jamaican emigrants or Caribbean emigrants, largely Jamaican, who moved to Ethiopia. Uh, and a, a group of uh, African Americans who had moved to Ghana, uh, among others. And then finally, um, Victor suggested I think about Zion, um, you know, not, not typically how we, how we think about it as homeland for the Jews, but in my, in my project I was interested in exploring the story of Zion and how it's motivated groups of people to seek the promised land elsewhere. Mm. Um, and Victor asked me to think about also um, the idea of capital. Mm -hmm. Uh, like to, to expand my thinking about Zion geographically, like as a place where people might go to try to achieve or discover the promised land elsewhere, but also an idea of, of capital for people who didn't necessarily leave. And so the final section of my book uh, explores the prosperity gospel, um, mm -hmm. particularly for, for people in a Atlanta and the South who, who follow televangelist Creflo Dollar, who some of you may know, he's a dynamic personality and an excellent showman. Uh, <laughs> um, but but for, for people who, who, who really have allied themselves to the story of, of uh, the Hebrew slaves in their, in, their, in their journey out of Egypt into the Promised Land and who grafted their own experience onto that story um, from the time of enslavement here such that they would... Uh, during slave times envision that it was the North and then have to retell that story when it turned out that it wasn't in the, in the, in the North huh. um, and recast that story such that it might be a place they would attain in the afterlife in heaven um, or that it might be something they could attain through, through capital, right? right. Um, that, that appeals very much to people who are adherents of the prosperity gospel who desperately want to get out of debt, um, who are promised by preachers like Creflo Dollar that if they tithe 10% of their salaries, they will receive um, abundant return. There is an idea that if they can achieve, uh, you know, what this nation is predicated on and, 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 mm -hmm. and sort of promises its citizens and yet hasn't delivered upon, sure. <laughs> upon for many of its citizens, that, that if they follow this set of um, behaviors or patterns of, of uh, reading, reading scripture and understanding scripture and tithing to the church, that they will receive reward is, uh, it, was, it became fascinating hmm. for me to explore um, why, that would, why that would be a narrative that would capture um, the imaginations and spirituality of so many, mm -hmm. because a lot of people follow the prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. In Albert Murray's uh, collection of essays, uh, The Omni-Americans, uh, he lays out a very simple uh, thesis in respect to so-called white identity, uh, so-called white people in America, <clears throat> that in fact, uh, to put it in very simple terms, they, they have no idea how black they are that, that uh, so-called white Americans have acculturated so much from African American tradition uh, and those traditions among American blacks that are retained from Africa, uh, but, but rather unconsciously, that, that, that they're not aware, simply not aware of it. And that part of the um, problem uh, of the future of expanding that circle of compassion, to borrow your phrase, uh, Victor, is uh, that 
blacks and those who are uh, multiracial, if you like, are tasked by whites uh, to have to constantly explain this or re-explain this to them. Um, Victor, do you think uh, do you think Albert Murray has a point? Um, I think Albert Murray already ha always has a point. <laughs> so uh, I would never say he didn't. Uh, but you know, I, I do think, like in these conversations, uh, sometimes um, I'm coming at it from a, a slightly different angle because my uh, my roots in the United States are much newer. Uh, mm -hmm. My mom is uh, Ugandan, so she's the she came. And my father's white. Uh, you might have guessed from that. Uh, but uh, from that, uh, but uh, she. So so she. So my uh, my my sort of understanding of the United States and all uh, comes also through her very her more recent immigrant mm. perspective on mm. things, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was talking about this over dinner last night with some folks that uh, the journey of my mom, say, as an African immigrant to the United States. Mm. Um, has been very interesting for me to watch because her journey was one of, uh, in some ways, very traditional. You come to the United States, you've heard that things can be, you know, you can have whatever you like and all this stuff, and then you get here, and then you're sort of given a choice, right? On a certain level, or you think at least you're given a choice, hmm. and you can choose to either be with the folks who say, oh, get, we got here, and it turned out it's not actually fair. The system is set up so it doesn't benefit everybody the same. Mm -hmm. And who would ever say, yes, I choose that, right? Or you can say, those people are just complainers. Hmm. They just didn't make the most of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to come in here. My group of people is going to come, come in here. And we're going to do it right. And we're going to make it. And so that was what my mom sort of what, felt, was, thought, passed on to me for, say, the first 10, 15 years hmm. uh, of my life, certainly. Hmm. Um, and then uh, I remember I was come, even to the point I remember coming back from college uh, and I had gone into my sort of Afrocentric black nationalist mm -hmm. uh, classes and all, and I was coming back and I was like, I'm going to tell you exactly how Africa works, mm. African lady. Mm. I'm going to tell you exactly how race works, uh, Ugandan woman, and all this stuff. And, so, and she, even at that point, she was still like, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. that's fine. Why don't you go back to school? Uh, and, uh, and we'll talk again when you're an adult, right? Um, but then an interesting thing started to happen. I started to come back to co uh, from college in my uh, like senior year, uh, and I came back home for graduate school. And then she's talking to me about, she, at, we're at dinner, she's like, do you know that this system is really rigged? Mm. And mm. I was like, what? Mm. And mm. she said, I mean, you got to talk about this guy, Dennis Kucinich. We got to talk about, I mean, and she was out mm -hmm. flyering hard for Dennis Kucinich mm -hmm. when he was running. Mm -hmm. uh, and then now uh, she's in our, where we live in Rosedale. She's out by the bank with her Sanders flyers, just like, you got to think about this guy. You got to talk about what this dude is doing. And it's an amazing journey for me. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So all my, I tell that whole story just to say that um, um, the sort of narrative. I think there are a number of things in what Murray was putting forth that he was taking as a given, right? right? Like uh, uh, white, uh, white America has, take, uh, has taken on many of these African-American cultural ideas and so forth uh, and don't even know that they're doing it. And as a result, we have to do all this. Right. But I think that uh, what's also fair to say is that there are lots of other groups who are not white Americans mm -hmm. who also in various ways benefit greatly That's from right. many of the things that African-Americans... Uh, Native Americans, various other groups of people struggled uh, struggled to achieve, mm -hmm. and and courses that they, uh, or rather, um, land that they may have cleared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that uh, it is now easier to walk on and say, well, this is not that bad. Mm -hmm. So it's never been that bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that's another. I feel like that's just a, if we're talking about multiracial America. Mm -hmm. Another conversation to have is a conversation that pivots away from necessarily just a black-white conversation. Right. Yeah, and also says there's a all these other groups of people who are all coming to this country in different ways, who are all fighting with each other. I mean, we don't even always just need. We don't even need white people to fight with all the time. We can fight with each other too, <laughs> yeah? And we can denigrate each other, tear each other down, mm -hmm. build each other up, mm -hmm. support each other, mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, but just to sort of say that I think like um, Murray's right, and at the same time I also want to say, and there's even more conversation right. uh, to be had about that question of who, who owes what to whom, mm -hmm. who doesn't understand what they were, what benefits have accrued to them, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, who doesn't give or get credit for those benefits? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I, th I think uh, uh, to Murray's uh, uh, point that, you know, it, it's a fairly conservative argument, you know, that he's making uh, tip typical of his, his politics. But I'd like to uh, circle back uh, to a moment you were uh, touching on here because you, you, you spoke a little bit about electoral politics and, and the presidential race. And of course, uh, uh, certainly the most prominent uh, multiracial American at this point would certainly be the President of the United States. And we uh, currently are in a, a period uh, of a political crisis in which the national conversation, if you like, uh, has become so bilious and we are uh, experiencing such uh, tremendous uh, uh, police, uh, racially motivated uh, violence. And circling back to, again to Murray's point, um, an in individual like Barack Obama, I think, uh, as Albert Murray said of uh, blacks in general, has been unfairly tasked uh, with uh, mediating and explaining uh, this aspect of his own black identity and therefore America's uh, black identity. Um, do you think that there is any uh, truth to that, John, in terms of his being unfairly tasked in this way? It seems, again, as Murray pointed out, that uh, multiracial Americans are put into something like what Du Bois described as a Sisyphus syndrome, that we roll that rock all the way up to the top and once again it rolls back down. Could you address that specifically in terms of what uh, the president has been tasked with or unfairly tasked with? Wow, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> it's a great question. Well, no, I mean, I, I think uh, any black person in a, in a position of uh, uh, authority, um, uh, or not just a black person, but a, a person of color, you know, finds herself or himself having to, um, you know, uh, present to people who are not people of color, to white people, a kind of story uh, that sometimes, you know, you, you want to assume they would know, but it's almost like, a, you know, in a, almost sort of a Sisyphean sense, uh, a narrative that has to be rewritten over and over and over again. And this is true not just for African Americans, but it's true for Asian Americans, it's true for uh, obviously Latinos, Latinas, it's true for uh, mixed race people, it's true for Native Americans, Arab Americans, again and again and again. And part of the problem is, you know, as I was saying in terms of the history, that we have this rich and complex history, but we all, we tend to see uh, kind of reproduced and reinscribed over and over mm -hmm. a very, very uh, boiled down and um, to me actually quite destructive uh, version of it. So with our, with our president, you know, I mean, he, he is the president of the United States. He's the president of empire. There it is. <laughs> right, you know. Um, but... Uh, you know, but his his story is a is a, is a, I think a really sort of fascinating story, and what I always wish is that you know we had had uh, as a as a country an opportunity to kind of think through the story of his parents mm -hmm. and uh, his father's journey, and I mean he's obviously written written about this uh, really quite uh, quite beautifully, but uh, I think as a society to, you know to think about uh, his father's journey and his mother's journey and how these two people came together, and then his journey uh, mm -hmm. as a as a person into coming into uh, selfhood and part of that selfhood is racial and ethnic identity. Mm -hmm. I mean one of the things I find so fascinating saying is um, I actually met uh, Barack Obama in 2004 when he was mm -hmm. running for the U.S. Senate um, mm -hmm. in Illinois mm -hmm. and he, at a colleague of mine's house. I was teaching at Northwestern and um, I was immediately blown away. Mm -hmm. You know, as he got up, he gave a speech without uh, notes and it was electrifying and I thought, okay, this man is going to be, <laughs> I didn't know he was going to be the president, but I said he's going to be the next senator, U.S. <laughs> senator from Illinois. And my thought was this is really exciting because of course he will be, you know, actually the first black senator uh, uh, of the 21st century, mm -hmm. and Illinois, interestingly enough, you know, will, will have given the country two black senators because Carol Mosley Braun was uh, was his predecessor. Um, but I immediately knew he was going to be uh, the senator, and I thought, well, this is great, this is black guy, and then you know, I got a little bit of his story, and I thought, oh, this is really exciting because he really, on one hand, uh, you know, he is, really does represent, you know, the kinds of possibilities that open up in uh, in the United States um, and so you know watching that 
that trajectory in the Senate, and then when he was running for president, you know, I was really kind of amazed. And then, you know, we we got the uh, I sort of witnessed this backlash. You know, so uh, there was a, the, you know the whole uh, issue with Jeremiah Wright and black nationalism, and uh, I, to me it. I totally made sense. I said, I understand why this guy is going to this church. You know, I mean, it makes mm -hmm. sense to me. You know, you, you know, it's a, it's an empowering experience. But of course, mm -hmm. it was painted in a in a sort of very negative light, and so you know, they had to get Jeremiah right out. And then there were people who said, well, you know, he's not really black. You know, <laughs> he's biracial. You know, mm -hmm. uh, or he's well, no one really said multiracial or mixed. It was like biracial. It was like you know, he's black or biracial. And I, said, mm -hmm. I kept thinking to myself, you can be both. You know, why is it so <laughs> difficult? You know, for people to understand. And people say, well, you know, well. He his, his wife is really black, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, so yeah, and then, and, then, and then I remember people would say, well, you know, he married a black woman, so that makes him like a real black person, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know, because she's mm -hmm. a real, that's a real sister, right, you know, mm -hmm. and people would say, well, and I admire her more than I admire him, mm -hmm. you know, but I admire him for marrying her. I mean, all these kind of, like, interesting arguments, right? Okay, so, and, and a lot of that, I mean, some of that stuff I, I was hearing just, you know, sort of among the, the black people I know and people of color, but then in the larger, you know, sort of the larger discourse, you get bits and pieces of this, uh, but you really didn't get a real discussion of it. I mean, because I think, this right. is, you know, it's so right. important to kind of think through uh, who Bar Barack Obama is. Then he became uh, president. There was all this sort of hope and... <laughs> hope for change and we, we you know I think of the whole he's been a he's been a, a, a very good president I think we'll look back and see he's one of the best presidents at least in my lifetime but what I find so fascinating now is it's he's black mm. there's no discussion of the complexity of his past and and not only just black but you know sometimes of course the, the crazy people say well he's Kenyan right? mm -hmm. I mean, on one level you know I mean, his father's from Kenya so but you know, he was born in Kenya and so you know go back to Africa I mean this crazy stuff and so even like it's like the complexity even that the sort of beginnings of uh, attempts at complexity to discuss who he was or his attempts to talk about who he was have sort of uh, been uh, boiled down to this is this black guy and you know he's we got to get him out of there and you know now we're in we're, we the, the let's restore America to the, I don't know, the 1950s or 1850s or something and it's, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's almost kind of mind-blowing. I, I don't think that, I think the president has tried to talk about his identity and uh, who he is. Um, I, on a certain level, I feel, again, to go back to something Victor was saying, you know, I, I still don't think the country's ready for it. I remember when President Clinton attempted his conversation on race. And I remember thinking, and he had, you know, the great historian John Hope Franklin, and I thought, you know, we're just not, we're just not ready for it. And particularly, and I... Forgive me for saying, I don't think white people are ready for talking about race. Mm. Because whenever you mention, I, when I read things in the paper and people are talking about race, like, everything is raced, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Whiteness is a race, mm -hmm. right? Or a racial category, mm -hmm. right? With complexity. And we don't even often really get into discussions of that. That's if you true. do bring it up, then it's weird. people are, talk, are told, you know, you're talking about bringing up the race card, et cetera. So, so I say all this to say that, you know, I think that the president has had to, has had to has had imposed upon him this uh, duty to talk about race, but when he has attempted to do it, often with subtlety, it's you, he he it's sort of shut down, right? Mm -hmm. It's not allowed, mm -hmm. and and it's not just about blackness and his own story, but I think as as we, when we talk about multiracial America, and as we see with some of these like you know little um, eruptions of various kinds of racisms, you know, within the larger frame of white supremacy. It's all it's it's the society as a whole and and, and its complexity that we really don't get a, a, a real discussion about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Emily, what what is your take on this? On the other hand, I'm just remembering 2008. I think he really used his multiracial identity, um, in particular his 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 biracial identity, to his advantage in terms of marketing himself as somebody who would appeal to the nation so that, you know, remember that quote, I don't remember it verbatim, but, you know, where he said, um, in essence, that he wouldn't have resulted in any other country in the world, that for his, um, you know, for his father, who's a, who is an African immigrant, who have met his mother, and then he talked about his white grandfather and his story, and so he was, um, I think, able to use his, his body and his physical form and the way that he was kind of a, a unifying, and this happens, I think, a lot to uh, biracial, um, black, white, biracial individuals, is that your body comes to represent some sort of 
uh, idea of um, utopia or, or u mm -hmm. unity. Mm -hmm. And I think he really milked that and, mm -hmm. and, it, and it worked well for him. Mm -hmm. um, he also configured himself as uh, Joshua when he was talking to um, Chris Christian groups and evangelicals in particular, uh, mm -hmm. that he, um, it, uh, he used his position uh, as mutually biracial and black mm -hmm. um, to say that he was standing on the shoulders of the civil rights movement in a really interesting way, right? Mm -hmm. That if we think about um, Martin Luther King as the, as the Moses mm -hmm. of America's most sort of optimistic moment, mm -hmm. um, who carried us toward toward civil rights, but you remember from the story, Moses doesn't, Moses doesn't actually enter um, the promised land. He gets to the mountaintop and he, and he sees it, but he doesn't enter. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that he was also very cagey, Obama that is, when he talked about himself in relation to that story, mm -hmm. to Christians, mm -hmm. he, he would say, you know, um, he, he configured himself as Joshua who, mm -hmm. who led, who led the Israelites into the promised land, and that, mm -hmm. that worked really well for him, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> Victor, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, recent writings uh, in the uh, Obama era, if you, if you like, um, Ishmael Reed has described uh, Obama's presence uh, as uh, provoking uh, or invoking uh, America's uh, racial demons, uh, releasing them uh, into uh, the culture. Of course, these demons uh, have always been with us, but uh, to be sure, uh, uh, Obama's uh, presence or even the image uh, has, as Ishmael Reed uh, pointed out many times, um, released these, this uh, Pandora's box of, of uh, demonic uh, racial hatred. Uh, the cultural critic Griel Marcus, uh, in a much overlooked quote from about a year ago, uh, furthered Reed's point and said that the uh, rampant uh, police murder uh, of blacks was in fact, uh, to his mind, um, of a symbolic origin, that uh, these police murders were uh, uh, symbolically or metaphorically uh, an assassination of the president. Uh, with those points in mind, Ishmael Reeds and Griel Marcus, could you respond to that? Do you think uh, there has been a uh, demonic uh, <laughs> uh, uh, opening of a Pandora's box? <coughs> uh, well, it's, um, so I mean, even, it's even interesting, like in the language, right? Like, I mean, because uh, I think like, um, sort of like the Pandora's box story is, is uh, like sort of unintentional, right? It's about unintentional release mm -hmm. of evil, right, into the world, or of pain into the world, of sorrow into the world. And then, the, and then so I, I think in, in, in a way, uh, using Pandora's box as uh, for Obama seems actually uh, quite uh, useful or relevant, mm -hmm. if only because, like, right, like if the rhetoric of his whole campaign mm -hmm. and what uh, made people so feel so vital about him, at least especially the first time around, mm -hmm. right, was this idea like, okay, you know, here's the magic pill mm -hmm. and we're going to be done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people saying like, okay, race will be over when we, racism will be over when we blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, like, America becomes then Pandora mm -hmm. and I guess he's no, that doesn't make sense. Uh, I was going to say he's the box, but that's not right. America's the box, I mm -hmm. guess. Uh, whatever. But you know what I mean. Uh, uh, um, but getting him in was essentially like slipping off that lock. Right. Right. And right. all these things that I don't think are necessarily surprising to everybody in this country. I, I mean, I'm certainly not surprised right. by how insane certain uh, segments of white America have become uh, because of uh, Obama's election, along with whatever other various things, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it seems pretty, I feel like, by and large, among my friends and I, we just kind of go like, yeah, right, <laughs> that's what was going to happen. This happen. is it, right? right? But I do think it's worth thinking, like, um, 
if if he is if he was a really one of the best manipulators of symbolism mm -hmm. that we've seen mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. hell of a long time, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean that in the both in the most positive and negative ways, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, I'm just thinking about like if you have thought that the and you have been trained by your schools and by the entire history of your country that the job of this country is to privilege mm. a certain kind of person mm. over another kind of person. Mm. And then you look up one day in your lifetime and then there's this person hmm. and he's the leader now. How would you not be driven out of your mind? Mm -hmm. Honestly, how would you not say something has gone wrong? Mm -hmm. I have to, I, I, I got to kick this over, I got, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I think for all the ways that I feel offended by whatever these, uh, show the birth certificate and tea party this, whatever the hell it is, right? Mm -hmm. I also feel like, you know, uh, looking at them outside of the context of what this country has taught them is not fair to them. Right. Because they have been told, this is your country. Right. And this country has done everything for the last three, four hundred years to, re to assert that fact, mm -hmm. right? Black GIs come back from World War II and white GIs come back from World War II. The black GIs do not get to use the GI Bill. The white GIs do. They create the suburban boom of the 1950s that becomes what we think of as modern America. Mm -hmm. Those black, I mean, that is the country saying to you, I specifically am here to help you. And to those people, we are not here to help you. Mm -hmm. It's good that you served and you died and blah, blah, blah. And that's what we allows us. To, we will let you then not be murdered mm -hmm. by us. But we are not going to give you home loans. We are not going to give you college loans. Mm -hmm. We are not going to let you create generations of wealth. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Because that's not our job. And then this dude comes in and says, I think we should make it the job. You know what I mean? It's just, it's like somebody suddenly said, you got to share the inheritance. And you see how when a family, when, a, when someone dies in a family and suddenly all the kids are like, I think I should get all mom and dad's money. <laughs> That's essentially what the fight is, you know? Yeah. Uh, and everyone's saying like, I think we should all share the money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At lots, I mean, lots of people, myself included, might be like, 10% uh, of the money and I'll take the other 90, right? I mean, I, it would take at my own selfishness. Right? I was used to, I was promised this, and now I'm not promised this. So I think like uh, Obama became all those things, and it's interesting to see uh, all of us trying to make it through essentially uh, splitting up the inheritance in a slightly different way, mm -hmm. right? And will we split it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I, think, I do think that's the question, like certainly the next few elections yeah. will be, how will we split it maybe, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, John, earlier, uh, before we got started this afternoon, uh, we were sharing a couple of comments about uh, uh, Donald Trump, and I uh, mentioned and we agreed about how deeply contextualized he is mm -hmm. in the history of this country, this kind of a uh, Carney Barker, snake oil, uh, vaudevillian uh, showman. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would like to introduce, uh, uh, moving further with, with Victor's point, the idea that, that he himself uh, is the embodiment of all of those demonic forces uh, that uh, Ishmael Reed uh, so eloquently has, has been writing about. Um, would you agree with that? Is, I mean, is he representative <laughs> of that kind of demonic <laughs> force? <laughs> very, very, well, you know, I mean, the man is a, he's a consummate showman. Uh, he, is a, he is an entertainer with some very dangerous ideas. Last summer when he launched his campaign, my immediate response was utter outrage at what he said about Mexico and Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. And to me, that should have been, th that statement alone, among many other things, but that statement alone should have should shut down it. his campaign, yeah. right? And my mother said, no, he's gonna go all the way. Huh. I, was, I was convinced, she was convinced, she's gonna go all the way. He tapped in, he, he knew exactly what he was doing. He tapped into something, uh, I think, sort of elemental that right. is always here and so bubbles up again and again uh, in, um, uh, you know, in, our, in our history. And it takes, it, 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 uh, takes on different manifestations. Um, 
But I don't think he's, I don't think Donald Trump is demonic. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think someone like Gary, uh, what is Barry Goldwater was demonic. I mean, I think these are people who are tribunes of what Victor was saying, of, you know, a particular way of thinking about um, the country. And of course, you know, I, I love the, the contextualization of the 1950s, that's sort of the post-war period. But we think even, you know, in, after Reconstruction, you know, or during Reconstruction, I mean, you know, that was another moment where, the, I mean, the country literally cracked in half, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, uh, the Union uh, and with, you know, uh, many, many uh, black soldiers uh, participating, uh, you know, and the enslaved people uh, in the South, you know, defeated the Confederacy. And we had the possibility of a reordering of society. Mm -hmm. And it was very clear, you know, to some people, you know, that this was not, <laughs> we're going to have this, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, some people, you know, talk about a, a moment of utopia, a potential utopia. Uh, and that was, it was crushed. And we think, you know, we think of the sort of brutal legacy of Jim Crow and segregation, <laughs> that was how mm -hmm. the powers that be mm -hmm. responded to mm -hmm. this possibility mm -hmm. of sharing that inheritance, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this was at a moment, we think about the moment of Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction, is a moment of leading into the Gilded Age when the country was at almost this sort of economic apogee. Right. What we saw, what we, you know, kind of seeing uh, again today, where the country is just getting, you know, parts of the country and the United States in general, with its economy, is just richer and richer and richer. And we have this sort of huge cleaving in terms of, um, uh, in terms of um, economic uh, inequality and social inequality and political inequality. So I feel like Trump is a kind of um, embodiment. I, I made the joke that you know there was the f the, the phrase that uh, Barack Obama used, uh, and I believe it's from. I said I think you. So part of my ignorance, I believe it's from June Jordan. You know, we are the ones we have been waiting for. And so I said to you, you know, Donald Trump is the one they have been waiting for, <laughs> you know. Uh, not, not, I don't know who they, I don't say they, but I mean, you think about the people with power, you know. Who, you know, you, you sort of think about, you know, who, who is this man really going to empower if he gets in office? Is he really going to empower the people that he claims he's going to empower? Or will we once again go back to what we saw just eight years ago where, you know, the, you know, it's sort of a, a kind of a version of what we have now, but on steroids, where, you know, <laughs> where, uh, you know, Wall Street just gets richer and richer and richer, and the country is sort of teetering on the brink, and we have, you know, we already are still in all these wars, but now we just have even more wars, because, of course, this person is insulting not just our supposed enemies, but our allies, and I mean, it's just, you know, like, like craziness, mm. but in a sense, I feel like, you know, this is, stuff is always here, mm. um, and maybe, maybe in part his rise is a reaction to Barack Obama, but I always feel like we're, you know, someone like him is always waiting in the wings, mm -hmm. or if someone like him isn't waiting in the wings, the people, you know, who really kind of control things, uh, not say there's like a conspiracy, <laughs> but you know what I mean, you know, mm -hmm. sort of the, mm -hmm. the system, let's say, let's say the system and the sort of structure, uh, will find someone like him to kind mm -hmm. of step uh, forward and uh, serve as the Tribune. And uh, meanwhile, you know, all the awful things that always happen will continue mm -hmm. to happen. Right? Mm -hmm. now, Emily, um, getting, getting back to uh, this, your book, uh, Searching for Zion, uh, the, the prominence of uh, spirituality, religious uh, belief, um, weaves through the entire work uh, in various chapters and places that you visited. Um, over the last few moments, we've uh, been talking quite a bit uh, about the use of sign and symbol and the power of language. Uh, in terms of multiracial black identity, um, I talked at the beginning about a unique relationship with language, uh, an understanding of uh, the unexpressed but intended and the unintentionally expressed, an understanding of that equation that's unique uh, to multiracial literature, multiracial identity. And thinking about uh, these ideas that we've expressed here about Barack Obama and Donald Trump and uh, the, the demonic and uh, the history of uh, the nation, do you think that there is uh, something unique to multiracial identity that allows for an insight to read 
and illuminate these signs and symbols in a way that is perhaps not available to those who are not multiracial, who do not have that experience? Uh, yes and no. I, I mean, I'm interested in hearing the others respond to this, too. I, I'm reluctant to claim some sort of exceptionalism. <laughs> Um, but I think at the same time we, we give our bodies um, show the lie of all of it. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what else to say beyond that. <laughs> beyond that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, you're mixed. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, another way, like, uh, that I uh, might in have interpreted, uh, what, or what I was thinking when you, when you asked that was, like, maybe why, the, you know, how much, uh, how rare it is for really interesting or, or uh, piercing insight to come from someone who is comfortably in the middle mm, of mm -hmm. things, right? Mm -hmm. That because if you're comfortably in the middle of a thing, then why would you want to pierce this veil? Hmm. Right, because I'm doing, you're doing fine. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but something that occurs to me. Um, so, but a, a moment for me, uh, a moment for me that where I felt like the, a veil of how much I was living in a center uh, uh, happened was when um, uh, Emily and I were living in Amsterdam about five and a half years ago, six years ago. Um, and uh, while we were there, uh, uh, she got pregnant with our son. And one day, and, and she, one day when she was coming back, she was uh, showing at that point. Uh, she came back home and she said, uh, this guy on the street said this very lewd thing. Mm -hmm. She told me, well, I'm not going to say what it was, but she said, he said this very lewd thing to her. Um, and... I was immediately like, well, let's go find, show me where he is. Let's go find him. I, I want to do something, you know, like whatever. And then she just sort of laughed and she said, are you kidding? You could never be a woman. Like men do this all the time. Mm. If I flipped off, flipped out every single time a man on the street or anywhere mm. said or did something lewd to me, mm. I would fight 16 times a day. Mm -hmm. Are you nuts? Mm. You're not strong enough to be a woman. Mm. And I was really like, oh. <laughs> All right, let's have dinner. You know, let's just go make dinner. But it was a moment where I realized, you know, uh, to this point, I just mean to say, mm -hmm. um, the only place where I could write that story or tell that story is in a situation like this, where it's a funny little anecdote. Uh -huh. uh, because I can't write from that, that place, that understanding, because I live in a place where I walk around the street, I never feel unsafe. Mm. I never do, mm -hmm. do you know? Uh, and that is a rare, I almost never do. Uh -huh. And uh, that's a rare way to, I, I, like when she said that to me and here and there things happen, I realized that's actually a rare place to live. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a place of great security mm -hmm. and being in the center of things. Mm -hmm. So it's unlikely that I would ever write in any convincing or interesting or insightful way, mm -hmm. I don't think at least, about being on the outside of that because mm -hmm. I just don't know it. I feel too secure and confident in like, well, you walk out on the street, you just go do what you want to do and you just do it. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way that many, many people live. And so I'm interested in this, to some degree, those people who are on the margins of safety mm -hmm. would be writing stories about that lack of safety that I would find interesting and want to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so similarly, I'm just thinking like maybe on the level of multiracial or on the level of gender, on the uh, sexuality, whatever it is, that there are, you know, the interesting stuff often comes from the people who can't say with surety, I am safe. Right. I am in this place of comfort. Right. And that uh, one of those kinds of people are multiracial. Mm -hmm. um, and good stuff can come from that. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. And I think that what, is one. Uh, well, just, be, just because we uh, are often in some way or another can feel like or be treated like we are not quite the center, not quite secure in what you are, not quite assured in when people see you or understand you. They know what you are and they, they say, you're part of us, come on in. Mm -hmm. Right, that that's not necessarily always the, uh, guaranteed and that that's the place where often interesting art generates, at least I think. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it's not solely multiracial. It's just anybody, I think, on those edges. Mm -hmm. You know. Now we uh, want to open this up uh, to a question and answer period, and we have our monitor here who, who will walk uh, the microphone. I'm sure there's some folks out here that would like to direct a question to our panel this afternoon. I hope, I think, someone does out there. Yes, yeah, please, uh, she can bring the mic to you. And you will not be on camera if you're concerned about asking a question. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, this has been uh, an amazing panel, and I want to thank all four of you so much for your thoughtfulness and your um, willingness to share. And um, I feel like I learned some things from it also. And um, I, w I was glad that uh, you uh, brought up this last point about uh, uh, the gender divide. And um, in coming to this whole program, I was looking at the uh, I was looking at the program, and there is nowhere near gender equity in the numbers of people that are participating in this. And that was so disappointing, but I feel like there's, you know, there's the same way that there's backlash um, going on, major backlash going on racially in this country, there's major backlash with gender as well. Mm -hmm. And it's scary. Um, and so thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kathleen. Um, Trump, okay. Um, I've, the only thing I can get out of this is that at least we know that anybody could run for president. <laughs> That's the only thing I'm getting out of this. But at the same time, I appreciated your comment, Victor, yeah. that I think it's important to see all the dirt because you can't, it's, it's not fair when people can walk around with a lot of secrecy about dirt. You know it's there, but no one says it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good in a way to get mm -hmm. it all out. Actually, I have a question. Thank you, everybody, for uh, your important words. And I want to go back to the sense of multiracialism and literature and how we complicate, how we need to complicate the images of, or the images, the stories and the, I guess, the picture of the multiracial character. Because we get this um, idealized, mm. um, good for commercials, mm looks nice in music videos, mm. version of, and the president, of the multiracial character. And your books, your books are incredibly um, fierce in terms of that kind of awareness, but of course that doesn't move into the public world. So can you give some thoughts about how we cycle this, this complication out to a more, a broader sensitivity? Mm -hmm. I think it's um, happening and, and will continue to happen as more and more people are becoming multiracial. I, I mean, I, I feel like I was born in 1976. Victor was born in 1972. I felt sort of, I was born here actually in, in Oakland. Um, Uh, but I, but I was raised a little bit, at least in my early childhood, to feel sort of like except, exceptional or odd. Right? I think it's just, it's not so odd anymore. Um, and so I think, even the ways that multiracial or bi biracial children or characters might be sort of co-opted co into commercials for perceived beauty or something like this, 
I think there's also, and there's some backlash against that too, right? Like that Cheerios ad with a sweet little girl and people who are angry that there was a black parent and a white parent in a commercial on TV, which seems ridiculously retrograde, but it's like, it's just too late. It's like this, it's not, it's no longer, um, you're no longer, like, we're no longer unicorns, right? I don't know that we ever were really unicorns, right. but um, I think that some of the anxiety that we've also been talking about, the anxiety that maybe Trump is capitalizing upon too, has to do with the fact that we're becoming an increasingly multiracial society where it, we're no longer fringe, really, to be a person of color or to be a, a mixed person. Mm -hmm. We're sort of becoming, I think, at the center, at the center of our own narratives. And uh, um, I just think that because of numbers, <laughs> that that's that's happening, and it will continue to happen more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just uh, add. I think that's a, a beautiful uh, statement. And I would just add that, um, you know, we just, we want to think about ways of um, supporting um, art uh, that depicts the complexity of this country. Uh, I think particularly uh, art that appeals to uh, a kind of mass audience. I'm thinking primarily of TV and um, films. I mean, of course, the situation with Hollywood is a little bit complex, um, complicated, pardon me. Um, but I think with, I think about what appears on TV, and I feel like you know TV has made a huge leap in a way, uh, in very in recent years, in, in some ways, uh, in terms of depicting you know the sort of rich tapestry of, of who we are, and it, you know many I think there, there are TV shows that go beyond just the kind of what used to be called I guess soft multiculturalism, you know, um, to sort of you know show who, you know who we are as. Um, as a, as a society. I mean, I think, you know, uh, a few years ago, the Schomburg Center uh, had a, uh, a chart. I mean, it may still be up to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in, in Manhattan uh, had this chart that talked about the changing um, face of black America. And it was really interesting. And I would tell people about this, you know, because there are all these new black immigrants, right? Mm -hmm. And not even just, but the children of, you know, immigrants from, you know, uh, parts of the world. And uh, they are reshaping how we think about blackness, right? You know, so, so as opposed to sort of a either or, it's a both and. But I mean, you don't see this so much. Um, uh, in, in a sort of our mass media, I mean, but there are places where you do see it. So I think, you know, uh, if, if we can figure out ways to, uh, particularly for children uh, and young people, but then for the larger society, uh, to, to sort of um, support work that is, is presenting this more complicated uh, picture, more complex picture, I think that's, that's w where we really need to go. And it's also not just the present and the future, but also our past, because our past, mm -hmm. as I said, is, is you know, we, we have these stories that um, point us in the direction of where we are now, and we just don't talk about them enough and see them enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have another? Um, so there are so many wonderful things that I think have been touched on and uh, glanced at from thinking about the market to thinking about the what, who owes who what, uh, which makes me think about debt uh, and thinking about the history, uh, not only, um, well, I guess, yeah, in terms of thinking about literature and novels. And for um, all three of you, I've been thinking about the fact that your work um, crosses genres, whether in discrete works um, or across the kind of the major genres from nonfiction to fiction to poetry, et cetera. Um, and I was wondering if um, any of you had thoughts around the trying to connect things between playing with the genre and a particular kind of identity politics or a particular kind of um, uh, thinking through uh, a multiracial personhood. Does playing with genre and these, these kinds of recombinant strategies, um, what gets fleshed out in, in that kind of play or those kind of hmm. uh, diverse efforts? Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, certainly I would say, um, like in, if you're talking about on the commercial end of things, right, or like in where things go in the bookstore, that uh, genre-wise things often do still remain quite segregated, right? Uh, and they are for market reasons. Again, people see the word poetry that they want to know they get poetry. They see nonfiction. They, biography, they want a biography, right? Uh, or at least they think they do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, I'm under the stern belief that like, you know, um, 
also to the previous question about uh, depictions of multiracial people uh, that big commercial enterprises can never, right? They can't ever innovate. Mm. They simply follow the trends. Mm -hmm. So like a popular entertainment would, in theory, would come up with a story about a character like President Obama in mm. probably 2050. Mm -hmm. And so I think the country's ready <laughs> for this, right? Mm -hmm. And but now is sort of like now there'll be a story about someone like that, and it'll be a commonplace because the country said you should catch up, right? Mm -hmm. And so that interesting idea of like um, uh, more feeling like at least I think it seems like more and more artists of various kinds refusing these simple uh, distinctions, these market-driven distinctions of genre, right? Uh, being something like the electorate refusing the simple old ideas that say commercial entertainment gave mm. us about who gets to vote for who, who gets to be mm. president. Mm. If it's a black president, then the world should end because that's what would happen, right? They, they believed. Um, uh, so crossing these genre lines, I mean, it, it seems strange whenever talking about crossing genre lines from, from my stuff if it, between like literary and horror and the fantastic and this. And I just always think like, but, do you not read books? Like, uh, <laughs> it has always been, uh, like, everything that you love as great literature, if you tried to pin it down as one genre, you absolutely could not. Huh. No, there's nothing that I think anyone could come up with that you wouldn't say, it's this, but it's also this, and it's mm -hmm. also that, right? Mm -hmm. But something happens at a certain point, essentially, it's around, it lasts long enough that it can now be categorized, and it becomes literature, huh. capital L, or it becomes young adult or it becomes something else, right? And you say, well, I'm pretty sure, you know, I don't know what, Huckleberry Finn is all of those things uh -huh. and is a thing I want to argue with and is a thing I want, right? It's all that. So, uh, so to me, it seems like, um, or I always feel happy when I see folks like us and lots of other folks doing these mixed things because I keep thinking at some point, then the bookstores, it'll say poetry-ish, <laughs> you know, <laughs> fiction-ish, right? And that, that, then I'll know, like, oh, we changed it. All right, time to do a new thing now, mm. right? Yeah. I just been looking at this for a long time. I just want to thank all three of you for just like, excuse me, kind of expanding the whole narrative shift and your expansiveness and explorations and uh, exploring the ambigu ambiguities. And we forget that like 25 years ago, there were so few writers doing this. We had Toni Morrison. Samuel Delaney, there was, I mean, I mean, we had all the classics, but I've noticed like kind of a seismic shift. Mm -hmm. And maybe my perception skewed because I work at City Lights and that's kind of the epicenter <laughs> of a lot. And you just travel 20 miles away and you're kind of a stranger in a strange land. But, <laughs> but really, I have noticed a little a, kind of a sea change in the so-called normative you know, narrative that's kind of widely accepted. And, You'd, all three of you would be, I think, tickled by the, the wide range of people who, who buy your work. And yeah, and I thank you. Yeah, That's great. all three of you. Yeah. So, yes, I want to thank you as well. Uh, amazing conversation. I just, um, you know how you're saying mixed people are not unicorns, we're more you know, common? You're in the epicenter of that. Yeah. Oakland is the epicenter. And, um, uh, when I go outside of Oakland, I know it's not quite true that the idea of, of, of identity is, is still difficult in the same way that, uh, uh, let's say, feminism, <laughs> identity of gender mm. is complicated when they don't, you know, there's not um, a sense of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. So in what sense is intersectionality part of a racial identity as it relates to multiracial Americans? And mm. what, uh, how, much of, um, how much of the work that multiracial writers do still based on exceptionalism, a point of view that other people do not have, hmm. do we, uh, and I put myself in the mix, do we have a particular role um, to be leaders or soothsayers or some kind of conduit for hmm. people to be better versions of themselves because we see mm -hmm. things in this, the racial version of intersectional way? Mm -hmm. I hope not. I mean, I mean, I hope we have the freedom to write, if we're talking about writing, or even just being peop people in the world. Uh, we talk about writing. I mean, I hope we have the freedom to 
imaginatively write w whatever the hell we want to. I mean, I, I, I really chafe, chafe at the idea that I have some sort of responsibility to teach people to be um, smarter about race. And yet I sort of do that also. So I, <laughs> you know, and yet I, and yet I, I don't know, I've been raised, raised perhaps to, think, to, to feel that's my responsibility. But I, but I also chafe against the idea that I couldn't write something that didn't have to shoulder that burden. But yet I also think it's, it is a place of insight that I feel blessed to uh, come from. I don't know if that, that answers your question. <laughs> I just say that uh, the tr I mean the truth of of uh, intersectionality and depicting that tr those truths because it's not just one truth it's multiple truths is a, is a way of sort of modeling how who we are showing who we are and maybe giving people a sense of what is possible uh, in our present time and the future so in the sense that you know I, I completely agree with Emily that you know we, we should not be under any burden to um, you know, teach or represent things in a certain way, uh, in a particular way to do a certain kind of work, unless you really want to do that. I mean, I think certain writers really want to do that and more power to them. But at the same time, if you're, if you're writing out of, uh, you know, out of truth and you're creating truth in your work, your work is doing that work. And that's incredibly powerful, right? Because one of the things that, I mean, it just sort of amazes me, you know, um, writers and uh, philosophers have sort of figured this out you know, for thousands of years, and now psychologists or experimental psychology and cognitive science are bearing it out that you know, narrative is one of the most powerful tools for uh, creating empathy, right? The circle of compassion that Victor is talking about, you know, that we have. You know, you can, you can actually change someone's mind. Psychology uh, studies show this. You can change someone's mind, sometimes even just, if, just temporarily, by having them read works of fiction. Right, mm -hmm. and we know with poetry, of course, it's it's language itself in its most elemental form that that can uh, <coughs> sort of provoke responses. So when you think about the, the sort of powerful tool that literature represents, it does do all kinds of, I think, often very good work. And the thing is, as I said, we want to encourage writers, you know, when it whether to 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 think about. Uh, in our, our intersectionality as, 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 as people in the world, particularly in terms of race, gender, sexuality, class beings, uh, our disability status, etc. I just wanted to add um, to what John just said, that I think as an artist, you're entering the wrong door of your project if you're thinking your, your job is to teach anybody anything, that you risk a kind of didacticism I, I reread uh, John's first book, Annotations, in anticipation of today's um, panel. It's a work that I really admire for its cross-genre. Cross it's called fiction, but, it, but it's so poetic, and it's, it's, an, it's an autobiography, and, and yet not. It's inventive, and yet it, it feels incredibly authentic. And what John has done with that book, and admits to doing at the end of the book, in a way that feels very not fictive, but but just true is that he discovered his own voice through the act of writing this series of annotations and, and mm -hmm. recollections and mm -hmm. um, and you feel very much a part of his consciousness and his mind as a as a reader and as a boy growing up um, at, at, but at the end of which he he claims that he he's arrived at his voice and it doesn't feel like, it's a beautiful piece of literature. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. Not that I'm here to be a commercial for, for his work, but I, I, I appreciate that he, he wasn't um, setting out, I, I, I'm quite sure, to teach us, to teach his readers something, so much as he was trying to discover something for himself, and he invited us in, along very generously on, on that journey. Um, yeah, I, I, I appreciated the artistry with which he um, looked for himself. Yeah, I mean, I think just thinking about literature as a learning process, because if you have this idea of something you want to communicate or teach somebody, then you're going to try to travel that path you know and as far as a person in the world just 
read the right stuff or just read anything and it'll broaden your zone of compassion then you go out into your day-to-day life and approach people that way Mm -hmm. um on another point one thing that kept coming up was kind of like the body as this repository of these ideas that we're talking about discussing and connecting that idea with John's discussion of slavery and the new world developing alongside capitalism and these development of enlightenment ideas. So the body is like a bearer of market externalities, but also like the limits of applying these enlightenment ideals Mm. and how we develop ways of thinking like scientific racism as finding their way into laws to kind of make these divisions. Um, And I wonder if like multiracial literature is a way to kind of show this refracted space. Mm -hmm. Is it it the only way or is it like the easiest way to kind of explore these ideas? Is it easier than other mediums like theater or television? If we can, I guess as a question, you guys all write, are you um, especially keen on works of film or TV that seem to do similar things or friends with people that do such work? Um, I'm trying to think about, I mean, I feel like as far as like writing goes, I, I'm uh, strong on writing as the method because that's the thing I like to do. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, and as a result, um, I have a bias in that direction. I, 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 uh, if I could write a if I could uh, write a play, I would be here talk shilling for playwriting. You know, uh, um, um, so I think that there so there's some way that it's really just down to that practical reality. You know, but um, uh, we've been talking. We talk a lot about uh, one of the benefits that things like um, actual like theater, like sitting in the theater, seeing theater or film or TV. One of the great gifts that they get to use is visual storytelling, right? And the ways that uh, a body walking into a space immediately communicates what, as a writer, you might take 10, 20, 1,000 pages mm. to try to communicate, mm-hmm. right? And that in some ways, uh, that's one of the, um, kind of like a, one of the deficits you just have to acknowledge when you're using the written word is that you can't, you can't give that immediate visual cue for what people can take. But the upside is that uh, what you can't necessarily do with visual storytelling is have that body come on and then complicate what people's initial assumption is about that body, Hmm. right? Hmm. Like uh, the written word lets you say, you saw this person walk in, you thought you instantly understood them. Hmm. And I'm going to now spend 500 pages showing you how you did not Hmm. that they were more complicated than you thought. Hmm. And that, that that internal world is the gift that fiction still has, hmm. and nonfiction and poetry, hmm. uh, right, that we get to do that. And that a reader, when they're sitting down to read, is on some level agreeing, you know, like it's a, when you read a book that is essentially, you can tell, is almost like just a screenplay waiting to be hmm. trans you know, waiting to be filmed. Hmm. It can feel frustrating because you say, well, I could have just watched a movie. I picked up a book because, or I opened my screen to read words because I thought I was going to immerse myself mm. in some, into someone's consciousness mm. or multiple consciousnesses, right? Mm. And I do think that um, that is still a trick that no other form of art has figured out how to do better than the written word, mm-hmm. right? Um, so we still got that, is what I mean. Any other questions? There must be. No? Oh, dear. Thanks for coming out, everybody. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) 